everyone. This presentation will be uh, about uh, our current work uh, with uh, Matterhorn, trying to use Matterhorn to, um, um, to build MOOCs, and uh, the combination of Matterhorn and, and OpenEdX, or uh, Matterhorn OpenEdX integration. Well, uh, by the way, I'm Vicente Goyanes, I'm uh, the CEO of Teltec Video Research. Uh, this, um, all of this starts with this project. It's uh, the Campus de Mar, Mar uh, MOOC project. Um, it's a pilot project of this uh, organization. The Campus de Mar International Campus of Excellence is a um, kind of um, uh, five universities or five institutions working together to build a uh, campus uh, focused on, on uh, sea science. The main goals <clears throat> of this uh, Campus de Mar MOOC project was to deploy an, an on-campus uh, ex-MOOC-like platform and uh, to provide also um, support to, to the professors on the production of, of the MOOC videos. But, uh, um, let's, let's start with a couple of definitions. I'm sure all of you know about MOOCs. Based, MOOCs stands for uh, Massive Online uh, Open Massive Open Online Courses. Um, but there are also a couple of uh, different type of MOOCs. Maybe when we think in MOOCs, we are all thinking in X MOOCs or MOOCs like uh, edX or Coursera, where where um, the MOOCs is based on a specific platform. Uh, they are typically um, instructor uh, or professor uh, guided uh, courses and so on. And, and the, the media is usually is copyrighted, it's not open media. Uh, there are other kind of MOOCs. Mm. Maybe in, in this first uh, type of MOOCs, uh, full time or full two hours lecture recordings are not the best uh, media uh, to, to build this kind of MOOCs. But there are other uh, type of MOOCs, these C MOOCs, kind of connectivism MOOCs or mashup. They used to be built around uh, open objects and, and maybe they're uh, full time uh, or two hour recordings uh, of lectures could uh, fit. I don't know how, how many of you had uh, hear about spooks Something, one only, two? Okay, great. Uh, well, basically, SPOOCS is, stands for Small Private Online Courses. It's just mm, somehow using uh, MOOC technology to teach online, uh, 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 sorry, on-campus students. It's, if you Google this term, um, you may find uh, statements like, next generation textbooks or online backbone for a flipped classroom or flipped college. And just ending with the definitions about uh, what the flipped classroom is. Um, basically, it's uh, a use case for uh, recorded lectures. Um, the idea is to, um, to, yeah, to, to uh, encourage the, the students to watch the recorded lecture instead of uh, assisting face-to-face uh, -to, -face to a physical lecture, and then uh, to, re to use the time uh, with the professor in the classroom for uh, other activities for instead of, of uh, the homework to practice. Um, well, about um, the first kind of MOOCs, the X MOOCs, MOOCs like Coursera or edX. Uh, some options about the deployment of this kind of MOOCs. We can think um, on an off-campus deployment. This is the typical case, again, for edX or Coursera. Uh, someone is providing you a platform, your university joins to the project, and then you start uh, creating uh, courses or uploading videos to, 
to the platform. And uh, the other option is, uh, or could be online on, uh, on campus MOOCs. You can build those, those MOOCs uh, on your servers using, for instance, Moodle, uh, Blackboard, or, uh, or Open edX. Another kind of classification of, of the MOOCs, or another aspect, is how video is delivered uh, inside those courses. Well, uh, off-campus MOOCs used to rely on, on YouTube. They are uh, embedded YouTube videos, are an off-the-shelf uh, on-campus uh, MOOCs platforms, like uh, the, those commented and, and open edX2, also rely on, on, on embedded uh, YouTube. But as many of them are open source, you can think in, in developing code and, and uh, build some integrations with other um, uh, media delivery systems. And, uh, well, let's start with how uh, Motherhorn can be uh, used uh, to build MOOCs. We can think here in two different user cases or use cases uh, for Motherhorn uh, in relation with MOOCs. The first one is uh, to use Motherhorn as a tool uh, to, um, uh, to uh, produce videos thinking in that uh, those videos must be uploaded to YouTube. So those videos must be uh, monostream videos. And the other use case is, uh, well, in this specific case uh, of on-campus uh, MOOCs, uh, we, uh, we are working on an integration of Motherhorn and, and, and Open edX in a way that we will be able, or we are currently able, to embed uh, full, uh, the full experience of, of Motherhorn player inside uh, these MOOCs. Well, <clears throat> focusing now on the first use case, we can think in two scenarios to produce those uh, MOOC-oriented videos. One is the standard scenario for, for Motherhorn. It's just recording um, the professor in the lecture hall. You can be recording lectures or conferences, and maybe you can... Uh, just cut pieces of those uh, lectures and use those pieces to, um, to build uh, or as clips for uh, your MOOC course. And uh, regarding the f audiovisual format, um, we'll uh, see soon some examples. Uh, the easiest way to uh, transform a dual stream Matterhorn video uh, in a YouTube compatible video is, well, just to upload uh, VGA plus audio. You can uh, go with different side-by-side uh, -side, uh, approaches, side-by-side -side, uh, plus uh, professor tracking, and in the self-recording scenario, you will uh, you can skip tracking because you can ask the professor to stand still in somewhere in the classroom, and then you can automata uh, automatically compound the professor plus the the VGA, as, as we will see in, in the examples uh, very soon. And uh, they said uh, on, on Motherhorn and on, and on Motherhorn capture agents, um, you can also build a special uh, places or what we call Motherhorn MOOC studios to shoot that, uh, shoot that, that, uh, that videos. And we are working with two uh, uh, specific uh, formats or products. One is the polymedia videos and the other is uh, what we call the invisible hand videos, those typical videos where you see a tablet and, and, and a hand uh, writing somehow. Well, let's uh, have a look of uh, some examples uh, related with uh, lecture hall recording. First one is the typical. I guess uh, people from Berkeley are also using this format uh, for their videos or for publishing their recordings in, in YouTube. We have been using it uh, 
since the beginning for the University of Vigo. It's what we call 50% side by side. And um, they're, well, it's a direct translation of the uh, Matterhorn player. An improvement to this approach is uh, what we call side by side plus tracking plus cropping. It's a post process uh, of the standard Matterhorn recording. I can show you an example here. Basically, that post process. With this uh, post-processing of the standard recordings, you get a more somehow compelling or um, you get better um, communication of the body language on a video that you can uh, upload to upload uh, to YouTube. Uh, the next approach could be uh, the self-recording uh, approach. Uh, we are uh, exploring this approach with, uh, of course, with, with Gallicaster uh, capture agents and, and, and uh, sets like this one. The idea is that the professor uh, shoots himself in a classroom without students. He go there when he wants, and he uh, uh, we, we we teach him that he must he must stay in, in a specific position. And if he um, if he follow if he follows our recommendations, then we can uh, automatically uh, deploy this kind of uh, of videos. We are developing it's almost done a uh, different uh, user interface for uh, Gallicaster capture agents. It's kind of of wizard for professors where they uh, well. It's a kind of easy thing. They can even select uh, the final layout uh, so we can uh, trigger the proper uh, workflow uh, to uh, generate that uh, layout. The good thing is, as we are recording the two separate videos, this is not a destructive uh, decision. We can uh, go backwards and, and we can provide him another uh, layout. But uh, if, if he um, select the, the proper one, uh, we can give him the video automatically without any human intervention. intervention. And uh, now, um, shooting videos in, an, in a specific studio. This one, for instance, is uh, a Motherhorn uh, or a MOOC studio based on Gallicaster at the um, UNED University in, in Madrid. UNED University is a, a very big university in terms of uh, number of students. They are over 200,000 around the world. It's a kind of open university in the Spanish-speaking world. And they are shooting crazy numbers, over maybe 50 or 60 clips a day. Uh, they have been, they, they had shot uh, over 1,000 in, 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 the, in the past months. And the, the outcome or the format is the polymedia format. It's a format um, created in the Polytechnic University of Valencia, and it works uh, really well for, for the MOOC uh, application. Basically, we can we can um, uh, produce these videos uh, almost automatically. Uh, you sh shoot the professor or the instructor in the studio. You record uh, the video from the professor and the VGA from the presentation, and then you can um, using two different uh, workflows. You can generate um, a standard Motherhorn. Uh, object, or you can generate that uh, merged video. And the other format is this uh, invisible hand. I list, I list 
I, I call this kind of videos invisible hand videos. It's, um, it's basically the same. Just you, uh, are, you, you, you should use an overhead camera instead of shooting the professor. You will be shooting the, the hand writing uh, on a Wacom or whatever uh, device. And then uh, with the proper workflow, you can merge the two videos, give some, um, reduce the opacity of one and, and, and merge one with the other. And it could be done almost uh, without uh, human intervention, intervention too. And here I end the, the first part of the presentation, of the presentation, and I'm gonna change gears to the Madhorn Open edX integration. Uh, so this is the other approach here. What we try to achieve is to embed uh, the full experience of the enriched Matterhorn player uh, as part of MOOCs. Um, and this uh, screenshot is, uh, is almost that. It's a, a course um, a MOOC uh, built using uh, Open edX with the, with the Matterhorn uh, player embedded. Our current integration is working, but it's um, a core hack it, uh, or core hack based integration. We uh, touch it uh, a lot, or we change a lot of things uh, inside uh, Open edX core. We write um, another model inspired on the YouTube model, what we call Pumukin model. Uh, the integration, you, um, as we will see in, in the next uh, slide, uses our legacy or our current media management system, Pumukit as, as a middleware between uh, Open edX and, and Motherhorn. Um, we also uh, make modifications in the import and export models of Open edX. And I must say that uh, having Open edX uh, working at a production ready level um, was really hard that we, we spend a lot of time on that and, and but we learned it a lot and, and we think that uh, starting from this point we will be able to uh, improve this this integration the problem with this kind of integration or this type of integrations is the low portability um, open edX is changing a, a lot and it's changing very quickly and it's been a little bit of a nightmare to keeping uh, the thing running. Well, this integration is more or less less like, like this one. Uh, we have here the Motherhorn core. We already had uh, the Motherhorn and Pumukit integration. We are using Pumukit as uh, the media portal for, for Motherhorn. And um, then we... Uh, we developed this Pumukit model. So uh, the Open edX core provides the HTML MOOC experience to the student. And with this integration, we are able, able to embed uh, our old videos, monostream videos from our um, legacy platform, and also videos, dual stream videos coming from Motherhorn. So if the student selects a monostream video, it will be um, sent from Umukit, and if he selects a dual stream video, it will come from uh, the engaged uh, module of Motherhorn. The Pumukit uh, thing also provides a media portal, uh, as I said, for the, for the Motherhorn videos, and the experience is uh, something like, like this. But we will want to go beyond this and, and we are working in another integration based on, on X-Blocks. X-Blocks are the um, uh, kind of plugin models for, for Open edX. Uh, it's a work in progress. Uh, it's working currently, but we, cannot, we are not able to achieve the same level of functionalities that we are uh, getting with uh, the core hack approach. And, and it's also uh, difficult because the, the, 
the proper the, the Dex block architecture is evolving also almost every day, and, and well, it's um, it's kind of difficult. Uh, but we will achieve for sure higher uh, portability. And our idea is as soon as we uh, are able to uh, write X block based uh, integrations, we will um, write uh, a, a direct, uh, yes, a direct Matterhorn integration. The idea is to go this way to. Not uh, the, the Pumukit model will not be needed anymore, and we will integrate using Pumukit X block and Matterhorn X block. So uh, the integration will be much more better, I guess. And um, what else? Um, we are also. <clears throat> Uh, working on, on automatic uh, collection uh, import. Um, we are finding that professors um, prefer to, uh, to somehow to import a full collection of videos and then uh, start uh, adding text and, and structure to the, to the courses. So we think we, we can improve uh, professors' uh, productivity with this uh, with this add-on. And oh, yeah. just oh, end, ending. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, my last. My this is my last slide. Um, well, the yeah. I think that that the, the this Matterhorn Open edX integration is could be a, an, an an opportunity. For for a uh, Matterhorn to um, yeah to to be able to uh, start in in the MOOC uh, world or to um, export the, the the experience that we are able to provide to students inside uh, Moodle or Sakai uh, to export that 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 experience of uh, watching enriched videos to the MOOC. Uh, uh, world or the, to the MOOC tsunami, and um, but also uh, this approach of um, using Matterhorn to uh, produce uh, monostream videos, videos that will be then uh, uploaded to YouTube. It's also a, a good opportunity. Professors uh, and professors are asking more and more uh, for help to to. Um, Produce videos for for MOOCs, and uh, well, the resources are not uh, uh, unlimited uh, for many of us. And I think that uh, using the proper capture agent and, and customized uh, Matterhorn workflows, Matterhorn could be a very interesting tool for uh, for these tasks. Task, and that's it. That's it. Thank you very much. I can, but it's got a delay. What sort of faculty uptake are you seeing with the um, studio version of the Galacaster units? Well, um, they, um, of course, if, if we record them uh, in the lecture hall, they don't do, they don't have to do anything because they, they have to, to teach that uh, lecture anyway. And in the studio, we ask them to prepare shorter. Yep. Uh, uh, many times, it's just a piece of what they are uh, explaining. Uh, in the classroom, but um, they have to do. They, they have to schedule with us uh, a slot for the recording, and sometimes this that is uh, small um, annoying things make them um, I don't know more reluctant, and that's why we want now to provide them many options 
they can also they can they can come to the to the MOOC studio, but they can also go to any of the recording um, ready lecture halls or classroom, and they can shoot. Uh, self-shoot or, or self-record them, themselves without having to schedule any. Thank you. Welcome. So the, uh, the studio setup you had, the quite posh looking one with the white background, is that, um, do you have people there to operate it for the staff or do they just go and initiate the recordings themselves? You mean in the studio or in the classroom? The, the, the one with the uh, like kind of green screen background where they could have mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, like background images from their PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in the studio we used to have uh, one, uh, one from our crew, at least at the beginning, because we are also placing a uh, Gallicaster touch screen inside the studio. So as far as uh, the professor, uh, well, as far as he is, he's willing, he's able to self-shoot himself. Uh, we used to, to, um, uh, to send uh, at least for 10 or, or 15 minutes one of our AV uh, uh, technicians with him and then uh, professors who are willing to, to do it themselves are, are able. Yes. It's interesting because we've sort of had the same feedback where we haven't done anything about it yet, but staff have asked if they could have a room with like a HD camera and some studio lights, but like sort of unmanned so they could go there and use it whenever they want to produce really short but high quality quick clips. So we're looking to see if we can use Sussex's uh, LDAP login for Galacaster to then get their metadata and then add it to their courses, but we haven't, we haven't done much with it yet. I think that Oli will. Yes, I think you should go to Oli's session then. <laughs> you, should, you should talk with Oli. Um, about the invisible hand scenario that you pointed out, um, does it work with your device uh, without post production? So uh, we did it for MOOC 2 and with lens correction and so on. That was quite a horrible scenario from my point of view, but I did not manage to convince the lecturer not to use it because. Um, uh, in post-production, this took quite a lot of time. Mm -hmm. but, and uh, do you have something prepared for the alignment of the hand with the VGA? Uh, you have, um, there are two, two big steps in the post-production. One is, uh, in the typical post-production, you uh, have to first do the synchronization of the two videos, because typically people is shooting with a camera uh, that's not... Uh, connected to a dual stream recording, recorder. Um, and then you have to uh, correct the geometry of the, of the shot. Uh, the point is um, the position of the overhead camera and to have uh, to place the, the overhead camera. If, if you place the overhead camera uh, far away enough, you get a, a very, you have no, no, no distortion and um, the correction is almost... Uh... Uh, yeah, so our lecturers did not want to use a vacuum uh, tablet. They wanted a vacuum monitor, and they don't want it a small one like Udacity proposed it. They wanted the large one as they feel better with it, and you cannot get the camera up enough for this. and So, so that was quite annoying, but uh, you still do the correction and the alignment with the... Uh, mm -hmm. Um, um, video editing program like Adobe Premiere, Final Cut, or whatever. Or do you have tools for this? That that's the old way. That's the old way. What we are trying to do now is to do everything inside Matterhorn, and uh, that's our goal. Currently, the um, um, the outcome is not as good as if you use Final Pro, Final Pro, Final Cut Pro, or whatever. But the productivity is. Uh, really bigger, so uh, we think that uh, it would be, it's worthwhile to, to go that, that way. Any other questions? Uh, you I again. So uh, I would place a question on the audience. Are there anyone among you who produces MOOCs already or is working on this? So uh, Harvard does this for sure, but I guess in different uh, units. Uh, but uh, we had our first MOOC, MOOC course, and I was quite shocked about the amount of work that goes into it, uh, 
compared to lecture recordings and how much money it did cost us. And I wouldn't, would like to share experience if somebody else is working on this. So we are producing uh, MOOCs. And we uh, do have someone in, in the production studio, unless the, the teacher asks that person to leave the room. Um, and we have now established a workflow where it's one hour of production, maximum for one clip, depending on the ability of the instructor to sort of um, well, go with the flow as far as uh, doing a presentation is concerned. And we have up to two hours of post-production in this, which um, makes sense in, in our scenario. So we Um, so our division of distance education at the extension school is often asked by Harvard X, which is the MOOC part of, of Harvard, uh, to give, they want our videos. So, but all we end up doing is handing them a USB drive and saying, good luck. And we hear stories that it does take a tremendous amount of time on their part to and money to do what they need to do. But they haven't yet asked us if there's anything that we can do to make this uh, simpler. You want to speak? Yeah. What is, in your opinion, James, that they need to do? What are they doing on top of what you have for a video to present it as a MOOC? It looks to me like it, it would be just OK to put the video in there. It, it would be the it would be the text, for example, that would need a lot of processing. But what what does the video itself need to be processed? That's what I'm asking. Um, in our case, they're taking existing uh, video lectures, so they're not um, for what they're asking for us. Uh, we've already recorded the lecture as it is normally recorded in the classroom. And they need to take that and chop it up into something that's usable. Um, yeah. And so they need to spend a lot of time with the instructor to figure out what is the best part of the lecture and how to chop it up. Um, I believe they are, they're also working on this kind of scenario of using a studio to capture uh, individual parts, but when they work with us, they're just asking for a semester's worth of video, which we gladly hand over on, on a big drive. Yeah, just to go back to what Rudiger was saying about the amount of effort involved. So if Elect Capture versus MOOC production, we're producing MOOCs and they're launching this year on um, Coursera. Um, for lecture capture, because, you know, the academics, they were doing that stuff anyway, giving the lecture. So if you don't count that time, there's about the equivalent of three FTEs worth of effort going in across the year to produce 20,000 plus hours of content. But for the MOOC, it's the exact opposite way around, where you might have 100 hours of effort to produce one hour of content. Because you've got to uh, take in all the time to test and evaluate the MOOC. And every MOOC, before we put it out, has to be evaluated by more than one person. And that's a lot of hours of work. So, you know, for an hour's worth of lecture capture content, maybe it's a minute's worth worth of extra additional time on top of what the academic would have been putting in anyway, because for us, they don't do anything. So it's just how much development time we put in. But for the MOOC, it's just it's a massive amount of work. But they, they serve two different purposes, and they're for two completely different audiences. Um, just about. Um, so Olaf, for example, pointed out the production cost. Uh, that's simply as a technici technicians who work on this. And um, for modifying a course for a MOOC or creating a completely new MOOC. Uh, it's the lecturer who's the most, uh, the best paid person in this group uh, still has to uh, invest a lot of time to update his course and so on and get new ideas for MOOCs out. And that's uh, for sure. So we have one hour of production and... Uh, I would say three hours of post-production there as our lecturer was very picky on technology that he wanted to use. And, um, but, um, yeah, it's only one, I would say that's half of the time that's getting into it and you need personal to run the MOOC and so on afterwards. Yeah, that, that, that's what we are, oh, sorry. just, just, um, 
what we are trying to do with this approach with Matterhorn to MOOCs is somehow to empower the professor to build himself uh, maybe not mm, superb uh, MOOC uh, videos, but at least some uh, decent uh, videos that he can almost uh, shoot and, and post-produce uh, himself without um, um, engaging us in, in a lot of work that we can not do uh, at this time at least. 